Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some question on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If a question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. To a conversation between a student and a professor. Good morning, professor. I hope you're doing well. I wanted to talk to you about an idea I have for organizing an event on campus. Good morning. I'm always open to hearing new ideas. What event are you thinking of organizing? Well, I was thinking of organizing a volunteer fair, where students can learn about different volunteer opportunities in the local community. It would be a great way for students to give back and make a positive impact. That's a fantastic idea. Volunteering is such an important aspect of personal and social development. How do you plan on executing this event? I've already researched and found several local organizations that offer volunteering opportunities. I plan to invite representatives from these organizations to set up booths at the fair. Students can visit the booths, learn about the organizations, and sign up to volunteer. Excellent. Have you considered the logistics, such as the venue, date, and time? Yes. I was thinking of utilizing the campus quad for the fair. It's a central location and can accommodate multiple booths. As for the date, I was thinking of scheduling it for a weekend when most students are available. What do you think? The campus quad sounds like an ideal location and a weekend would indeed ensure maximum student participation. You'll need to coordinate with the campus administration to reserve the space and check for any conflicting events. That's a good point. I'll reach out to the administrative office to secure the location. I also wanted to discuss the promotion of the event. Do you have any suggestions on how to spread the word? Definitely. Utilize various channels to promote the event, such as social media, email newsletters, and posters around campus. You could also collaborate with student organizations and clubs to spread the word among their members. That's a great idea. Collaborating with student organizations will help reach a wider audience. I'll make sure to reach out to them. Additionally, I was thinking of having a guest speaker who could share their personal volunteering experiences. It could be inspiring for the students. Having a guest speaker is an excellent addition. It will provide valuable insights and motivate students to get involved. Do you have anyone specific in mind? I'm still researching potential speakers, but I'll make sure to find someone with diverse and impactful volunteering experiences. It will add depth to the event. Wonderful. I'm impressed with your initiative and dedication to organizing this event. Remember, I'm here to support you throughout the process. Let's schedule regular check ins to discuss your progress and address any challenges that may arise. Thank you so much, Professor. Your support means a lot to me. I'll keep you updated on my progress.
and I'm grateful for any guidance along the way. It's my pleasure. I look forward to seeing this event come to life and witnessing the positive impact it will have on our campus community. Good luck, and don't hesitate to reach out if you need any assistance. What is the main topic of the conversation between the student and the professor? What does the student plan to do during the volunteer fair? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. That's a fantastic idea. Volunteering is such an important aspect of personal and social development. How do you plan on executing this event? What does the professor mean when he says? Volunteering is such an important aspect of personal and social development. What attitude does the professor express towards the student's idea? What can be inferred about the professor's role in the event? Listen to part of a lecture about old-time plays in France. The professor is talking about how they wrote plays in the 1800s. Good morning, everyone. Today, we'll learn about the theater in France a long time ago, in the 1800s. People back then had a special way of writing plays that worked well. Let me explain. In the 1800s, French writers followed a specific plan called the well-made play. This plan aimed to interest the audience with a carefully made story, exciting parts, and a good ending. Famous writers like Eugene Scribe and Victorian Sardou made this plan popular. So, did every writer use this plan in the 1800s? That's a good question. Not all writers followed the plan exactly, but many used it. The well-made play idea became well-known and was often used. It helped writers make interesting stories that caught people's attention. The special plan had some important parts. First, there was a clear beginning, where the characters and their situations were introduced. This set things up for the problems that would happen later. Then, the story unfolded with carefully planned scenes, each making the tension and excitement grow. The well-made play also had surprises and changes to keep the audience interested. These unexpected moments added fun to the story, making people feel excited and surprised. Also, 
The plan stressed the idea that everything in the play had a clear reason, a cause and effect relationship. This made the story move logically and kept people interested. When the story got to the most exciting part, called the climax, the tension was highest. This led to an ending that tied up everything and gave a good finish. A satisfying ending was an important part of the well-made play plan. To show how this plan worked, let's look at the play, Scribe and Sardu's The Gladiators. In this play, we see the beginning where the main characters and problems are introduced. As the story goes on, we see planned scenes that give new information and make things more tense. The play has surprises, like when we find out who the main character is, changing the power between the characters. Everything in the story has a clear reason, keeping it logical. Finally, at the most exciting part, the story gets to an ending that makes everyone feel satisfied. What are the speakers mainly discussing? According to the lecture, what was an important part of the well-made play formula? What does the professor mean when he says, the climax? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. As the story goes on, we see planned scenes that give Scribe and Sardu's the gladiators new information and make things more tense. What does the professor mean when he says? Scribe and Sardu's the gladiators. What is the likely outcome when the tension reaches its peak in a well-made play? What can be inferred about the role of surprises in a well-made play? Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. The professor is talking about how bats use acoustical signals. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to explore the fascinating world of bats and how they navigate using acoustical signals. 
Bats are remarkable creatures with unique adaptations that allow them to thrive in diverse environments. Of course, bats use a process called echolocation to navigate and find their prey. They emit high-frequency sounds that are beyond the range of human hearing. These sounds bounce off objects in their surroundings and return to the bats as echoes. By analyzing the time it takes for the echoes to return and the changes in the frequency of the returning sound waves, bats can create a detailed auditory map of their environment. This enables them to detect obstacles, locate prey, and avoid potential threats. Different bat species emit different sound frequencies and patterns, allowing them to occupy distinct ecological niches. For example, some bats emit short, rapid pulses to navigate in cluttered environments like dense forests. Others emit longer, more spaced-out pulses for long-range detection in open spaces. Bats have specialized adaptations to enhance their echolocation abilities. Their ears are finely tuned to detect and interpret the echoes, and they can accurately determine the direction, distance, and even the size of objects using these echoes. Bats have specialized adaptations to enhance their echolocation abilities. Their ears are finely tuned to detect and interpret the echoes, and they can accurately determine the direction, distance, and even the size of objects using these echoes. Bats' ability to use acoustical signals is not limited to navigation. They also use vocalizations for social communication, finding mates, and defending territories. Some bat species even engage in complex vocal exchanges that resemble conversations. It's fascinating to note that bats have evolved diverse acoustic strategies to coexist with other bats in the same habitat. They exhibit a phenomenon called acoustic niche partitioning, where each species occupies a unique acoustic niche to minimize competition for resources. Understanding bat acoustics is not only crucial for appreciating their remarkable adaptations but also for conservation purposes. By studying their unique vocalizations and echolocation patterns, scientists can gather valuable data about bat populations, behavior, and ecological roles. What are the speakers mainly discussing? According to the professor, how do bats create a detailed auditory map of their environment? What does the professor mean when she says, echolocation? Why does the professor mention the example of the horseshoe bat? What is the likely outcome when bats engage in acoustic niche partitioning?
what can be inferred about the significance of studying bad acoustics for conservation purposes. Listen to a conversation between a student and a librarian. The student wants to learn about the resources available at the library. Excuse me, are you the librarian? Yes, I am. How can I assist you today? I'm new here, and I wanted to learn more about the library's resources. Can you help me? Of course, I'd be happy to help. What specific resources are you interested in? Well, I'm currently taking a course on environmental science, so I'm looking for books and journals related to that field. That's great. We have a dedicated section for science and environmental studies. Follow me and I'll show you where it is. Here we are. This section contains a wide range of books, journals, and reference materials on various aspects of environmental science. You'll find books on topics like climate change, biodiversity, sustainable development. That's fantastic. I'm also interested in staying updated with the latest research articles. Are there any online databases or journals I can access? Absolutely. We subscribe to several online databases that provide access to scientific journals and articles. One of the most popular ones is the Sciency Direct database, which covers a broad range of scientific disciplines. You can access it through the library's website using your student credentials. That's exactly what I need. Thank you for letting me know. Are there any other resources or services that the library offers? Yes, we have a few other services that might interest you. We offer an interlibrary loan, which means if we don't have a specific book or article you need, we can request it from another library on your behalf. We also have private study rooms that you can book in advance for group projects or individual study. That sounds helpful. I'll keep those services in mind. By the way, do you have any workshops or tutorials on how to navigate and make the most of the library's resources? Absolutely. We frequently organize workshops and tutorials on various topics, including research skills, citation management, and database searching techniques. I recommend checking our library website or subscribing to our newsletter to stay updated on upcoming events. That's great advice. I'll make sure to do that. Thank you so much for your assistance. I feel much more confident now about utilizing the library's resources effectively. You're very welcome, Sarah. It's my pleasure to help you. Remember, if you ever have any questions or need further assistance, don't hesitate to approach any of the library staff. We're here to support your academic journey. I appreciate that. Thanks again. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Which online database is mentioned by the librarian? What does the librarian recommend to the student for staying updated on upcoming events and workshops?
Why does the librarian mention interlibrary loan and private study rooms? What can be inferred about the significance of interlibrary loan? Listen to part of a lecture in an anthropology class. The professor is discussing the value of birch trees to some Native American groups. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to discuss the rich cultural significance of birch trees for certain Native American groups. Birch trees, scientifically known as betula, hold immense value in the lives of these indigenous communities. Professor, why are birch trees so important to Native American groups? That's a great question. Birch trees have multifaceted significance and are deeply intertwined with the cultural, spiritual, and practical aspects of these communities. Let's explore some of the reasons why birch trees hold such value. First and foremost, the bark of birch trees has been used for centuries by Native American groups for various purposes. It is highly versatile and can be harvested without harming the tree. The bark is often used for making canoes, containers, baskets, and even shelter. For example, the Ojibwe people of the Great Lakes region have a long-standing tradition of birch bark canoe making. The lightweight and sturdy properties of birch bark make it an ideal material for constructing canoes that are essential for transportation and fishing in the region's waterways. Additionally, birch bark has been utilized for its medicinal properties. Many Native American groups have used it as a natural remedy for various ailments. The bark contains compounds with anti-inflammatory and analgesic properties, making it useful for treating conditions such as skin irritations and mild pain. Birch trees also hold spiritual significance for some Native American groups. They are often associated with purification, renewal, and the cycles of life. The white bark of the birch tree is seen as a symbol of purity and is used in ceremonies and rituals to cleanse and purify the spirit. Furthermore, the birch tree has been a source of artistic inspiration for Native American artisans. The intricate patterns and textures of the bark have been incorporated into traditional artwork, such as birch bark biting and etching. These art forms serve as a means of storytelling, cultural expression, and connection to ancestral traditions. Another interesting aspect is the cultural and historical importance of birch bark scrolls. These scrolls were used by some Native American groups, such as the Ojibwe and Iroquois, as a medium for recording important information, including stories, treaties, and historical events. The durability of birch bark ensured the preservation of these records for generations. What are the speakers mainly discussing? What is an example provided by the professor to illustrate the use of birch bark by the Ojibwe people?
Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. First and foremost, the bark of birch trees has been used for centuries by Native American groups for various purposes. It is highly versatile and can be harvested without harming the tree. What does the professor mean when he says? It is highly versatile. Why does the professor discuss the medicinal properties of birch bark after mentioning its practical uses? How does the professor connect the use of birch bark in canoe making to the practical needs of Native American communities? What can be inferred about the cultural role of birch bark scrolls in Native American communities? <laughs> 